I cannot believe that my main critique of this movie is that it should have been longer. Hello everyone, my name is Caitlin and welcome back to my channel. So first of all, apologies for not saying my intro in my last video. I don't know what happened there. I was in a weird mood where I was like, intros are outdated and so I'm retiring it, but I have since decided that that's stupid. So I'm going to be candid with you all today when I say that I was actually not planning on making this video. Descendants The Rise of Red came out last Friday and I watched it on premiere day with my sister and I didn't like it and that was that. But you guys made it abundantly clear over on my Twitter that that just simply could not be that. And so here we are today. First of all, I just wanted to say a quick thank you to you guys for forcing me into this because I do think that I have come around on this movie a little bit after giving it a rewatch. I don't think it is as bad as I originally thought, but I do think that it is just filled with so many plot holes and continuity errors that a hardcore Descendants fan like myself just couldn't ignore. So get ready for a review with a ton of nitpicky opinions by yours truly. And of course, I must give a spoiler warning before we jump right into it. So we begin Descendants 4 or Descendants the Rise of Red with an overview from Uma. She explains the classic Oridon lore and the absence of our other lead characters. According to Uma, Ben, Mal, Evie, and Jay are off sailing on a new adventure. So that is the only explanation that we get for why our favorite characters from this very beloved franchise are no longer here. Which is a little bit disappointing because I feel like if they actually would have put in some effort to explain why the original characters aren't there, then that honestly would have done numbers for promo. But at the same time, I also understand that this is a spin-off movie, and so maybe they didn't want the original characters clouding the way for this new story that they're introducing. And so they had to explain why they're not here, and they had to do it fast. And another reason why they might have had to do it this way is because of things getting reworked in production. Like the Royal Baby plotline, for example. For those of you that might not remember, back in 2022 when we got our first synopsis of the film, it said that the events of this movie would take place amongst the announcement of a new Royal Baby. And so obviously fans concluded that that means that Ben and Mal are expecting. And I'm not really too sure as to why this plot was abandoned, but it is really unfortunate as it was the main thing I was looking forward to in regards to this movie. You could argue that it got cut because of Ben and Mal not returning, but I personally feel like we wouldn't have even needed to see them for this to still be a thing. It could have been as simple as them saying that they were off on a boat. But nonetheless, this plot line was apparently cut and there is no baby on the way as far as we know. Back to the movie, we then find out that Uma is stepping in as headmaster of Oridon Prep. In a move that is very reminiscent to the first film. And of course, I'm referring to Ben stepping in as king despite his very capable and very alive parents. But I feel like I can't complain about them doing this again because it is very descendants of them and it was necessary for plot reasons. Uma then invites her pirate crew into her new office. And even though I knew that Gil and Harry weren't going to appear in this movie, I still just can't deny the disappointment that I felt after not seeing them here. The parallels to the first movie then continue as Uma shares her plans to allow the kids from a wonderland to attend and Oradon Prep as her first order of business. And she defends this choice by saying that it's what Carlos would have wanted as we pan over to a picture of him hanging on the office wall. So this is a very controversial topic that I've truly seen dividing the fandom. I've talked about my take on this in the past, I believe in my Ruined Characters video, where I basically said that I was disappointed by the choice to have Carlos be no longer alive in the Descendants universe. As if you don't know, this was already confirmed in the Royal Wedding short that came out in 2021. And I'll try my very best not to get emotional while talking about this as this particular choice does hit me very deeply. First of all, I will admit that I do see both sides. On one hand, the series is primarily targeting children, and so this is a great opportunity to teach them about death and grieving. And there is the possibility that it could have been confusing for the younger viewers to have Carlos still alive while also knowing about the tragedy of Cameron Boyce. But I can only speak for myself, and my perspective is that we already lost Cam. And so I personally saw Carlos as a way for him to continue on. Carlos is a character that I personally love just so very much and I just don't think it's fair that he has to suffer the same fate. He could have easily been going off to vet school, marrying Jane, living his best life, and I just can't help but think about how easy it would have been for them to say that Carlos was on that boat too. None of the other main characters are here besides Uma, and so we really didn't need that explanation with Carlos. And I hate to say it, but it almost kind of feels like they're trying to capitalize on his passing. They know that if they mention him, then it's going to create headlines, which is exactly what ended up happening. And it's just so unfortunate because I feel like them mentioning him in any sense would have created headlines, and so I don't feel like Carlos needed to no longer be alive for that. And like I said, I know that everybody has their own opinions on this, but I just personally hope that his friends and family are okay with this decision. Or I guess just his family, because we already know that his friends aren't, at least the ones that were involved in these movies, I guess besides China, as they all made it quite clear that it just wouldn't feel right to continue these movies on without him. But that is all I have to say on this topic. I ask that you guys please be kind to me about this in the comments, as it is just my own personal opinion. Moving on, we then see Uma's letter of invitation 
Mansion flying to Wonderland. And can I just say, like, how many times has Disney tried to spin off a franchise with Wonderland and it hasn't worked? Maybe I'm just thinking about Once Upon a Time, but I'm just like, if it didn't work then, what makes them think that it will work now? Anyways, this is when we have our first musical number and when we meet our new lead character, Red, who is the daughter of the Queen of Hearts. So we are introduced to her in a very rotten to the core-esque number, but this is also when we get our first look at Wonderland and the just CGI overload that it is. But honestly, I feel like in terms of Wonderland, the CGI style kind of works. I mean, Wonderland is supposed to be this wacky and over-the-top place, and so I didn't find the CGI when used in Wonderland to be that off-putting. And then in regards to the song, I really didn't think it was that bad. And honestly, I don't think that the soundtrack overall is as bad as everyone's saying. There are two songs that I don't like, which we'll obviously get to, but honestly, I feel like the others are fine, and if I did enjoy this movie a little bit more, then I would probably have them on repeat. But what I will say is that I feel like where this number is lacking is in the fact that it is a solo. I think part of the charm of Rotten to the Core and Ways to be Wicked and whatnot is in the fact that they're group numbers. Without that camaraderie and you're like bad to the bone type of song, I feel like it just ends up falling a little bit flat for me. We then meet Maddox, who rescues Red from these guards that she's causing havoc to. And I feel like they kind of failed to explain as to if he is the Mad Hatter or the Mad Hatter's son, but after some research I have been informed that he is the Mad Hatter's son, which I found to be interesting as he is quite older than Red. I feel like they probably did that so that they could avoid sending him to Auradon as well, but I personally feel like I would have been a lot more interested in their dynamic if they were the same age. We then come to learn a little bit more about the conflict between Red and her mother, which is of course the same conflict and lesson that we've already learned in the previous movies, which is that Red wants to have control over her own life and that she is not her mom and doesn't have to be like her, which is just, what a concept. Like, I wonder where we've heard that before, but I guess if it's not broke, don't fix it. But now it is time to meet our other protagonist, Chloe, the daughter of Cinderella and Prince Charming. And can I just say, like, independent from everything, Brandy and that reunion aside, I just don't understand the reason for choosing Cinderella's child as the lead here. We've already explored Cinderella's son, Chad, in the previous movies. Obviously not to the same extent, but still. And there are just so many other villains and heroes to choose from in the Disney catalog that we haven't gotten to see explored yet. And so I just don't understand why they chose one that we already kind of touched on instead of giving us someone new. Chloe could have easily been Rapunzel's daughter or Tiana's daughter, and I feel like it really wouldn't have changed that much story-wise. And it also wouldn't have created any complications with the previous Descendants story. It almost seems to me that they wanted to do Cinderella, and then Chad was kind of an afterthought. Like, oh shoot, we already kind of included her kid here, I guess we'll just give one throwaway line to acknowledge his existence. But honestly, it was that one throwaway line that ended up being the highlight of the movie for me. But also, while we're on this topic, I just have to say thank you to Jedediah and Paolo for giving us that extended version that we deserved. If you haven't seen it, they posted a TikTok with a little skit between Charming and Chad, which is pretty fantastic, and so I do recommend checking that out. Anyways, I am getting a little bit ahead of myself, and so let's get back to the Charming family. Brandy then enters, and the couple goes on to do a wonderful rendition of So This Is Love. It's beautiful, stunning, all of the above, and I honestly don't understand how this couple has not aged whatsoever. But unfortunately, I do have to get back to complaining once again. As Prince Charming says that this is the first song that they ever danced together while they were in school. Cinderella then confirms that they first fell in love back at their school's dance called Castle Coming. And I'm trying my very best to ensure that we do shout out every single time that this event gets brought up throughout this film. And if you haven't seen this movie yet, you'll understand why I'm doing that later on. Anyways, this basically confirms that this version of Cinderella actually has nothing to do with the original Brandy film from the 90s. So while these actors are reprising their roles, they're doing so as completely different versions of the characters, which kind of creates a bit of a mind boggle. Which I really didn't like and kind of makes me question as to what's even the point of including them if they're not going to be the same people. I guess it is still a fun cameo thing, but I did find that to be a bit disappointing. Moving on, Chloe then goes on to receive a pair of glass boots as a gift from her mom for being a good person. And we come to see later on why this gift might be problematic as it begs the question as to if you really are a good person, if you have to be rewarded for it. But what I like about this is that I feel like it kind of shows how Chad turned out the way that he did and makes me wonder if he was also receiving gifts for being a surface level good person, which I feel like would explain a lot. But back in Wonderland, we finally get our first appearance of the Queen of Hearts. She is portrayed by Rita Ora, which I have absolutely zero complaints about. I feel like she did amazing and I loved her and her character. And actually, I feel like the acting in this movie, I have zero complaints about overall. Like, I feel like they all did great. Good job, guys. But this actually brings us to something else that I liked, which is that I feel like they were really able to dive deeper into the abuse that Red suffered from her mom in a way that they really weren't able to in the previous movies. This is probably because this is a Disney Plus movie instead of a Disney Channel channel movie, so the queen this time around is like truly evil and they do not shy away from showing that or making her
her like a genuine threat in this movie. This then brings us to our next musical number, which is Love Ain't It. And I'm sorry, but I have to steal a joke from my friend Emma here when I say that neither is this song. This is basically like our evil like me, but red version. And I get that like she's the queen of hearts and so that's why love gets brought into the equation. But I feel like it's kind of odd that they're arguing over the existence of love when that's not really relevant to Red's character. Really, they're just speaking about the kindness that she has for others, which I guess you could argue equates to love. But I personally feel like this song would have made way more sense if it came after Red had like already fallen for somebody or something. But coincidentally, this then brings us to my next point, which is that we then have the first meeting between Red and Chloe. And I mean, the sparks are just flying already, if you ask me. I just feel like they have a wonderful haters to lovers arc that I unfortunately know will never happen. But if it did, Love Ain't It would have been a great response to that. We then learn that Ella and the Queen, formerly known as Bridget, went to school together. They were friends until this prank that was played on her at Castle Coming, second mention, ended up turning Bridget evil. Also during this song, the Queen shows Red her future in the looking glass, and it shows the two of them ruling side by side. And Red is also in this like killer look that I feel like is probably her best one in this entire film. So maybe she should go evil for like the good fits. I don't know. But moving on to their orientation ceremony, which begins with a What's My Name reprise from Uma. And I love this. I like to think that Uma makes everybody perform this reprise with her whenever she's presenting anything. But then I also kind of feel like including a song from the previous movies kind of just highlights how not up to par the songs are in this one. Uma also notes here that she never actually went to the school that she is now in charge of, which I found to be quite funny and ironic. But now it is time for our main point of conflict in the film as the queen then takes over the ceremony in a way that is very reminiscent to Maleficent crashing Ben's coronation in the first one. But I guess the difference here is that this attack is happening at the beginning of this film instead of the end. But this is when I feel like this movie finally starts to take shape and become its own thing. This is also when we get our third reference to Castle Coming and the prank that she suffered from as Cinderella stands up to the queen. Unfortunately though, this results in Red and her mother declaring her guilty of treason and sentencing her to a beheading. So like I said, some very high stakes here with the Queen of Hearts. Luckily though, Red quickly realizes that what she's done is wrong and decides to use her pocket watch to go back in time and fix things. But Chloe ends up getting into a fight with her during this process and they both end up getting sent back together. So I feel like now is a good time to talk about the hair because I feel like now is the first time in which the inconsistencies with Chloe's wig are truly showcased. After they get sent back, it looks way bigger than it did in the scene before it. And I've seen many posts online showcasing her wig's various transformations that happened throughout the movie. And I feel like I just have to admit that the wigs just really weren't for me in this film. Honestly, both of the leads, color palettes and wardrobes just really weren't for me in this movie, particularly Chloe's, but I didn't really like Red's that much either. I don't understand why they have to be just so incredibly vibrant as I feel like Mal and Evie's weren't that way in the previous movies, but maybe I'm biased there. And I think that the only look that I actually liked in this movie was Bridget's, but that could also just be because pink is my favorite color and I like hearts a lot. And also, I don't know if you guys noticed, but like every single member of the Charming family has some blue in their hair. Even Charming himself has a blue streak. And so once again, Chad is the odd one out. But anyways, we're now back in time. And the first character that we meet is a young fairy godmother. This is one of the few scenes that she's in. And I honestly wish that we could have gotten to see even more of her. I feel like she's one of the few characters where it actually makes sense to see her at a school for witchcraft. But then this brings us to our next musical number, which is a fight duet between Red and Chloe. And honestly, it's another heated moment with lots of chemistry that just makes me ship them even more. And I do enjoy this song and the use of a musical number to get the two of them on the same side and keep the plot rolling. The girls then enter Merlin Academy, which is the school that later turns into Oradon Prep. But what I don't understand here is why we couldn't have used the same school locations that we've seen in the previous movies. I feel like they could have easily set dressed it to make it look like it was from the past and make it look different enough. And I feel like by doing that, it would have created less of a disconnect and make this movie feel more like a Descendants one. And it also would have made for much less CGI used backgrounds, which is what I would have preferred. But this is also when we get another mention of Castle Coming, and it's when the girls realize that they are now on this mission to stop this prank from happening. This is also when we meet the headmaster Merlin as the girls enroll in the school to keep their cover. And I enjoyed Merlin a lot. I feel like he was a lot of fun and kind of gave me fairy godmother vibes. Though I must admit that I have not yet seen the Sword in the Stone, so I don't know if him being principal of this academy does create some plot holes for his story or for his movie. So you guys can educate me on that in the comments down below. Anyways, Merlin brings the girls to alchemy class, where we get to see them meet the young versions of their mothers. And this scene and just the whole concept of alchemy class, I found to be really fun. It's kind of more Harry Potter than Descendants, but I still enjoyed it, so I'm not complaining. I also 
also liked the addition of this because obviously in the future, the use of magic in Auradon is kind of frowned upon. So I feel like we would have never gotten to see them have a class like this in the later movies. And I feel like the events of this one do a good job of explaining why that is the case. Then this brings us to what I think is the fan favorite musical number, which is Life is Sweeter. This is Bridget's song and I don't mind this one either. I think it gives some heavy twister frown upside down vibes from Teen Beach 2. And then once the villains join in on it, it gives more of like a My Year from Zombies sort of vibe or like a Camp Rock versus Camp Star kind of thing. This is also when we meet Team Aladdin and Jasmine and the Disney Cinematic Universe plot holes just continue. Cause I feel like their story just makes absolutely no sense if these two are also attending high school together. Like when would the events of their movie have happened? How old are they? Like I just have so many questions. And also why are they so cringy with the choreography and the ship name and the heart hands? Like, no thank you. Since writing this script, this moment has gone a little bit viral on TikTok and I find it to be absolutely hilarious. And I'm glad to see that everybody agrees with me on this one. We also meet a young Charming here for the first time and then we are introduced to all of the villain kids. So we first have a young Captain Hook, AKA the dad of Harry Hook. We also have Morgie who I'm still kind of a little bit confused about as to who he is. Maybe again, it's because I haven't seen the sword in the stone, but apparently he is the son of Morgana Le Fay from King Arthur and not Ursula's sister Morgana from The Little Mermaid 2. We also meet a young Maleficent and Hades who have one of their only lines in this song, which is just so unfortunate because I would have absolutely loved to see more of them and learn about how those two got together. And then lastly, we meet their leader, Uliana, who is Ursula's younger sister. So obviously including all of those characters and saying that they all go to the same high school together kind of creates some weird connotations and plot holes for their original stories. And I also feel like it kind of ruins the lesson that they're trying to hammer home with Bridget, which is that evil isn't born, it's made by just having all of these villains as villains just right off the bat. I feel like it would have been way more interesting if they went back in time and these villains were just like normal guys who are just living their normal lives. But on the topic of these young characters, later on we see our first and only, I believe, shots of another new character named Zelly. As far as I'm aware, Zelly was first reported as being a teen Rapunzel or as the daughter of Rapunzel. I feel like it's still unclear. A lot of fans then, including myself, kind of called this out as Rapunzel was locked in the tower as a teen, so I'm not too sure how she would have had time to attend high school. But apparently her name has since been changed to Meadow, possibly because of this backlash, if you can even call it that. Either way though, I'm kind of confused about her existence as she was only a background character and was only seen on screen for about five seconds. This makes me believe that she was maybe a part of a deleted scene or will be featured more in the following movie, which I don't think that I've mentioned until now. So also back in 2022, it was reported that we would be getting two spinoff films. They haven't really spoken about this second one since because I personally feel like they're hoping that we forgot about this. That way they can re-announce it next month at the upcoming D23. And also while we're on the topic of this, I have since seen it be reported that we're actually dealing with a new trilogy here. So more Descendants, yay. Honestly, I wouldn't be like disappointed by more Descendants if it wasn't like this, but. Anyways. Anyways, Uliana steals these cupcakes that Bridget has made, eating all of the feathers off of them and basically turning into this like flamingo hybrid. This causes her to want revenge on Bridget even though Bridget warned her not to eat them. After this, Charming comes and interacts with Ella for a little bit and Castle Cumming is brought up again. But then after he leaves, Ella actually goes on to ask Bridget to go with her as friends. And I found this to be very suspicious and also kind of made me ship the two of them, which I just think is funny because I also don't think that that was intentional. But we then have a scene with the girls going over to Cinderella's to ask her more about Uliana and try to figure out what she's planning. And this was the scene that I was referencing earlier when we talked about the gift that Chloe received from her mom. I feel like this scene created some great development for Chloe's character. Although I did find it a little bit disappointing to see them over at her house because it just felt like they were hammering home even more so that this movie has nothing to do with the other Cinderella movie. But Ella tells them where Uliana's hideout is and the two of them go there to spy on them. This brings us to Uliana and her crew's song, perfect revenge. And to be blunt, if I may, I hated this song and found it to be incredibly annoying. Although I will admit that it does kind of have like a zombies vibe to it. But this is when we actually find out what their prank is. So basically their plan is that they need to steal this forbidden sorcerer's cookbook and then serve Bridget a cupcake from it. So not the best plan if you ask me and also not very creative. They're just basically doing the same thing that she did to them on accident back to her, but on purpose. But yeah, this cupcake would I guess turn her into looking like this monster-like thing, um, and then their revenge would be complete. 
And this is actually the only reveal that we get for this prank that they've been hinting at for the entirety of this movie. And it's not even a proper reveal, like we never actually get to see it happen. It's done through this like animated cauldron sequence, which is just so incredibly lackluster and disappointing. But then this scene is actually followed up with an even more CGI mess of a moment that I would argue is the worst looking thing in this entire movie. Besides Chloe's wig, maybe. So the girls go to Bridget and ask about the cookbook. We have another mention of Castle coming and we find out that Bridget it already has the looking glass. So the girls use it to look into their future and find out that the queen has also captured Prince Charming. Even though she locked off the courtyard and is holding everybody hostage and Charming was supposed to be visiting Chad in university. And so I don't know how he found out about this or how he got there. But unfortunately, I think that that is just another plot hole that we will never get an answer to. So Red decides that they need to steal this cookbook from Merlin. But Chloe isn't convinced that that's the right thing to do and stresses over Castle Coming being tomorrow. So Chloe decides to go to her mom and she learns that things aren't always so black and white and there is a gray area, even when it comes to good and evil. Which is funny because I feel like these movies themselves sometimes discredit that lesson, but it is still a good one and I feel like they should have highlighted that in like Descendants 1. But she explains all of this to her through a song that I've heard a lot of people say is their favorite. And like I said, I agree with the sentiment of it, but the song itself really isn't my cup of tea. And part of me feels like it could have been cut for time and was a little bit unnecessary, but that's just my opinion. Opinion. Anyways, this meeting with her mom leads Chloe to decide to help Red steal the cookbook. The villains then come in after they are successful and try to open the book but end up getting hexed by it. Which I feel like creates another plot hole because if they don't have good intentions then they didn't have good intentions the first time they tried to do this. So how are they able to unfreeze themselves and get into the book to complete the prank the first time that this all happened? I feel like it makes no sense but enough questioning of the logic of this movie as now it's actually time to wrap things up. So Red and Chloe decide that stealing the book is enough and they can just go back home now. No attempt to use the looking glass to double check that their future is okay. No castle coming, the event that we've been hinting to during the entirety of this movie. We have the cookbook and apparently that's enough, so it's time to go home. When I also just don't understand what would have stopped Uliana's crew from doing something else to Bridget after they served their time in detention. And you would think that after everything that they've done and the gravity of the situation that these girls would have at least checked to make sure that this prank didn't happen before they decide to go back in time. But no, apparently we need to wrap this movie up very quickly. So they go back to the present and find out that stealing the book was enough to stop Bridget from turning into a tyrant. When they get back, the queen turns, revealing her now all white outfit, and she throws her playing cards up in the air to create a bunch of floating heart bubbles surrounding them. We go into a Life is Sweeter reprise and remix, and Uma warns us, saying that messing with the fabric of time is dangerous and that you didn't think this was the end of the story, did you? So I feel like the terrible ending is one thing that everybody can agree on. Why tease us? and get us ready for Castle Coming for the entirety of this movie just to skip right over it. And it's also like, is it really a Descendants film without a big event at the end of it, like Coronation or Cotillion? I wanted to see ball gown outfits and we didn't get that. I feel like this ending just really turned this not great movie into an even worse one. And I know that people are saying that it's okay and that they're going to get to it in the next movie, but I don't understand why they couldn't have given us that extra 30 minutes to wrap up this one first. I almost wonder if they knew that people weren't gonna respond that well to this one and so then they decided to leave this one as open and confusing as possible to ensure that people would return for the sequel. Or maybe they just ran out of budget. Anyways, that is my Rise of Red review. I hope that you guys thoroughly enjoyed it. I decided to do it in a little bit of a different format than how I used to do my decom reviews back in the day, but I really enjoyed doing it this way because it made things a lot easier for me and ensured that I didn't forget any of my many thoughts that I had throughout this movie. And again, after I got over the drop shock that I felt after watching it the first time, I really don't think it was that bad. Or at least it wasn't as bad as I originally thought that it was. Though I will admit that I am now just like a little bit more concerned about what this means for Zombies 4. But I am still holding out a little bit of hope based off of the fact that we at least have Meg and Milo returning for that one. Anyways, if you're wondering where I've been lately, I've been working on a very long video that I basically put on hold to put this one out for you all. And so I'm gonna get back to working on that now. Uh, thank you guys so much for watching. I love you all very, very much. And I'll talk to you very, very soon. I feel like this just shows that if you guys bully me enough, I will make any video you want.